everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, something my lab has been really interested in, that how uh, this reliability gene expression due to hybridization can contribute to the origin of uh, RBA personal genesis. So let's start with this. Um, well, we all know that you know, a very basic biological observation is that you know, sexual reduction is dominant in eukaryotes. So most eukaryotic species at least occasionally engage in sexual reduction during their life history. And this you know, pattern indicates that the genetic machinery required for meiosis already evolved in the last eukaryotic common ancestor. On the other hand, uh, all the asexuals are rare. You can look at this number here. However, the transition from sex to asex has happened many times independently in many phylogenetic lineages. So this uh, very broad you know, phylogenetic pattern and contrast between the dominant sex and how rare asex is, you know, basically tells us you know, sex has a lot of uh, evolution advantages over you know, longer evolution time. And also, there are a lot of studies characterizing the genetic consequences of being asexual, something like you know, genom genomic meltdown, accumulation of dietary uh, mutations. However, very little work has been done looking at or looking into the genetic mechanism uh, about how this transition from sex to asex can occur at genetic level. And I think we should really care about this because, first of all, if we understand more about genetic mechanisms, we may be able to understand more about the consequences, genetic consequences of being common asexual. And secondly, if we know a little bit more about the, um, you know, how they can become, if go from sex to asex, you know, this, this big pattern here that how, how few asexual lineages we have contrast with how many asexual lineages we have may not just be because you know, the evolution advantage is due to sexual production, it may just be because, you know, it's really hard to become asexual. <coughs> so I think that's something we should consider in explaining this, you know, evolution of sex. So uh, something really interesting about, you know, all the asexuals is that a lot of them arose due to hybridization. So as you see here, a very good example of that is all, you know, the uh, all big asexual vertebrates, including geckos, you know, lizards, all of them are hybrids between two divergent sexually reproducing species. And uh, the research questions we are very interested in to address, the first one is, you know, when you have these two divergent par parental lineages, they hybridize, they br that brings all the parental ideals into the same genome, how would this hybridization event affect the gene expression in the hybrid genome? And also, we expect that due to this hybridization events, you know, the gene expression change, gene expression may change a lot in the hybrid genome. And the next question I want to address is how do these changes can contribute to the origin of organic parthenogenesis? To address these questions, we use uh, the model system so-called uh, water flea, you know, Daphne and Pulex. So Daphne and microcrustacean live in freshwater ecosystems. So the typical way that these animals will produce is what we call the cyclical parthenogenesis. So basically that means, you know, we all learned this in basic zoology, that under favorable environment, these animals can be produced by themselves. You know, females giving birth to daughters. You know, if you don't consider rare mutations, they're genetically identical, right? But under unfavorable environment, Let's say when the food becomes scarce, or population becomes too dense, or the pond is drying up, these, uh, these, these animals can switch to a uh, sexual cycle. And at that point, males will appear in the population because sex is, is environmentally determined in death. And also, due to this environmental stress, females can switch to uh, sexual reproduction, producing uh, hypergametes. And then this, you know, this mating can happen, these animals can produce what we call the resting eggs. And this resting egg can be you know, left at the bottom of the lake or the pond, and they will hatch again when the environmental conditions become suitable again. 
right? So that's a typical reproductive strategy for uh, Daphne Pulex. However, for some populations of Daphne Pulex, especially in the uh, North Seas of North America, or including here, if you sample a pond, if you find Daphne Pulex, I, I bet you that you will find an oblique asexual clone. So the big, the big difference between the oblique asexual clone, that's what I call the asexual, compared to the sexual clone is during the uh, under environmental stress, they need to produce these resting eggs. But this time they can do it by themselves. Females, the females can uh, produce diploid resting eggs without the need of fertilization by sperm from males. So that's what I'm, you know, I'm trying to show here. You don't need males over there. So, so how these and how these how are these all the asexuals related to hybridization? So in my recent work, I show that these hybrids, or these all the asexual animals, are historical backcrosses between two parental species. And these two parental species is the uh, the sexual Daphne pulex living in pond habitat, and the other parental species the pulicaria Daphne pulicaria living in permanent stratified lakes. So these two species have, you know, uh, become ecological divergent. They have this, you know, strict dichotomy. You find you only find Daphne pulex in pond, pulicaria from lakes. And also in terms of phenotypes, they also look, uh, they also show like a lot of differences in terms of body size, growth rate, and lifespan. So this graph here just shows you that you know uh, these other asexuals probably originated through some really complex historical backcrossing scenario. As you can see here, each bar here represents one clone of you know other asexuals, and the color here corresponds to how much you know how much ancestry they have from those uh, two parents. As you can see, the uh, ancestry varies greatly across you know different uh, lineages. So the goal of this study uh, is, to, is to use a little specific RNA-seq analysis to understand the gene expression changes in other asexuals compared to the uh, sexually producing parental lineages. And to achieve that, we are mainly looking at the mode of inheritance or gene expression and also the uh, regulatory divergence in the parental lineages. So we have a sample size about you know, uh, of two of each, you know, the parental lineages and also the oblique asexuals. Even though the sample size is small, but we still have some pretty interesting results. So first, let's take a look at the uh, inheritance mode of uh, gene expression. So after sequencing the transcriptome of these animals, we, be, we can you know, quantify the expression level for all the genes. And here we're focusing on about, you know, 5,300 genes, and the reason is that uh, these genes have the uh, parental alleles. You know, parental alleles coexist in these gene in these gene regions. And for the inheritance mode of expression, you know, after after we quantify the you know the levels of expression in, in the parents in the hybrid asexuals, we can quantify them. Uh, we can divide them into uh, six basic categories. For example, if the expression level doesn't change at all across you know, the parents and uh, hybrid asexuals, we can call them uh, less conservative. And if you have something, if you have hybrid asexuals right in, right, in the, right in the middle compared to the parents, that would be an additive. And also you can have you know, one parent dominating the uh, expression mode. The most interesting ones where I'm paying a lot of attention to are those what we call the misregulated. Those are the underdominant and overdominant. So these genes in the hybrids, they, uh, for the underdominant genes, they express, those genes are expressed at much lower level compared to both parents. For the overdominant ones, that those genes are get expressed much higher than both parents. So that's totally different, something you don't see in the parental lineages. So we consider those as misregulated genes. So after doing the analysis, uh, we find that you know the a big uh, a big finding of this is that about one third of these genes are misregulated. They are either uh, underdominant or overdominant, right? 
And also notable, what's notable here is that underdog genes are much more frequent compared to the um, compared to the overdog genes. So well I'm I have been really wondering if this you know enrichment of underdog genes is something shared by other object asexual hybrids. Because well, I, I get, I'm not aware of any other studies have, have done this kind of analysis in hybrid asexuals. So that's you know kind of cool. You find some genes that behave, behave very differently in the hybrid asexuals. The next question I want to ask is, you know, what causes this kind of uh, upregulation or downregulation in the hybrids? So. For doing that, uh, we're going to take a look at take a look into the uh, regulatory divergence uh, in the parental uh, parental lineages. So here we can, you know, uh, for between the two sexually reproducing uh, parental species, we find a lot of fixed nucleotide differences. So also in the obvious asexuals, when you have those two alleles together, we can compare. Basically, you can quantify the expression level of you know, the blue alleles, red alleles in the parents, and also you can quantify the, uh, their ratio in the optic asexuals. So by having this you know, allele-specific analysis of the expression ratio between parental alleles, we can do some analysis to infer the regulatory divergence uh, in the parental lineages. So before I go further, I just want to remind everyone about you know, what kind of regulatory divergence I'm looking into. So basically, I'm looking into the trans regulatory divergence and you know, cis, regulatory, uh, cis regulatory divergence. For cis regulatory divergence, basically, I'm looking into the, uh, uh, I'm too slow. <laughs> well, the, um, basically, looking at physical link variants. For trans elements, those are just transcription factors. So, well, the idea here is that we can just buy looking into the in the hybrids about you know how much divergence uh, how much uh, divergence in uh, expression cannot be explained by cis regulatory di cis difference those can be attributed to uh, trans di uh, trans uh, divergence so what we have here is you know uh, the cis regulatory changes you know more common than trans alone this is consistent with other studies and also uh, a lot of genes can uh, affected by both cis and trans regulatory divergence so for the misregulated genes, uh, we brief here, we find that compensatory changes are enriched for that. So basically, purified selection plays an important role maintaining constant level of gene expression across species. But uh, that requires cool adaptive cis and trans elements. But when you break this down into hybrids, that could cause the, uh, what we call the misregulation. So this is just to show that. So the breakdown cool adaptive cis and trans elements in, in hybrids Indicates the presence of you know what we call the Dobjansky Miller incompatibility. So what what does that have to do with um, parthenogenesis? So parthenogenesis in the Daphnia is something like this. It's a modified meiosis. Cytokinesis one is inhibited, so there's no uh, cell division at the end of meiosis one. This becomes a mitosis-like process. And from cell cell biology literature, we know that. You know, we need proper expression CTC20 to knock down the level of cyclin B. And cyclin B is really important for initiating cy uh, cytokinesis at, um, at the end of meiosis 1. So in this case, we have under expression of CTC20, then we'll have you know, higher level of cyclin B, and then that could cause you know, suppression of cytokinesis 1. So that's our current work working hypothesis, where you know, we'll probably do some more molecular work by manipulating the level of expression. Uh, to test this hypothesis. With that, I want to thank my lab, my collaborator, and UTA for funding. Thank you very much.